Okay, hi everyone. This is going to be the video for chapter 11, the first video in the series here. What are we looking at in this chapter? Right, well, we're going to look at property dispositions, right? So anytime we have a disposition, right, a disposition event, that is going to trigger, right, it's like if there is a disposition, then we have to calculate and use their formula, right? The amount realized minus the adjusted basis. Typical disposition you're going to think of is, hey, we sell the asset. We will see there are various types of disposition events, right? Um, but typically we think sell, right? Uh, in this framework, right, when we have the amount realized minus adjusted basis formula, right, we're going to calculate our realized gain or loss. Most of the time, our realized gain or loss is going to be our recognized gain or loss. We'll talk about uh, the difference between those terms, but the general rule is they will be the, uh, the same. There are some exceptions, right? So we said typically what you do and when you have a disposition event, it triggers this equation. Most common type is a sale, right? So uh, if we look here at 11.1, Right, we have a taxpayer, they sold a machine, uh, and it looks like they got some money and some securities. They paid a selling fee of $500. What is their amount realized? Right, well, your amount realized is generally going to be the fair market value of what you receive, right? The cash plus the fair market value of the securities minus any selling expenses. Oh, okay, $300,000, we have a disposition event, we triggers that equation. The first part of the equation is amount realized, typically the fair value of what you got here, $300,000, right? So that's what it's saying down here, right? The amount realized is generally the fair market value of what you receive. Typically it's cash, right? But it could be other property, it could be debt relief, right? What do we mean by debt relief, right? Well, if you think about something like student loan, Forgiveness. Imagine I said to you, like, oh, I'll forgive $10,000 of your student loans. Uh, well, it's like you got something in that case, right? I got uh, my loans wiped out. So if we were to sell a piece of property that maybe had like a, a lien on it or some type of loan or mortgage, like we sell a house that has a mortgage on it, and the, uh, the buyer is like, look, I'll take on that mortgage. Well, that would be something we receive. We value that. Uh, basically at the fair market value, right? It's kind of like, you know, we'll look like there's like Kirby, right? He has sort of his like vacuum. Everything that comes in there, we just value it at the fair market value. Now, uh, when we talk about the adjusted basis, right, in that equation, right? If disposition event triggers the equation, we talked about amount realized. Adjusted basis is your initial tax basis minus cost recovery allowed, typically something like depreciation on there. Uh, not all bases are created equal, right? In other words, in practice, you'll hear, you'll hear like, uh, oh, what's his basis in that? What they're getting at typically is adjusted basis. But if we were to be specific, there's a difference between initial tax basis, what you start with, and then how after you back out depreciation, it's adjusted tax basis. You also have book basis, right? Like how you carry things on your books and records. That's, you know, a different type of basis, but we're in tax land here, right? And when we talk about the initial tax basis, like what you start with, right? It really depends on how you acquired this asset, right? Most of the time, right? In, in the same way that most of the time you sell an asset, most of the time you're going to purchase it. We will see, however, there are other mechanisms. You could get it as a gift. You could inherit it. It could be something you use in a personal capacity that you convert to a business use, right? Typically, you got to remember here, we're talking about like a Schedule C taxpayer um, who has business in their property, right? That's when this would come into play because, you know, if you're going to take depreciation on something, it's got to be a business use asset. In like, you know, 1040 land, like if you just sell a stock, right? Well, then it'll be amount realized minus adjusted basis, but you're not going to depreciate that stock. It's not a business use asset. 
All right, so we said when you have a disposition event, it triggers the amount realized minus adjusted basis. We're now looking at adjusted basis. We said adjusted basis equals your initial basis minus any cost recovery, typically depreciation. We said your initial basis is going to uh, basically be, uh, you know, dependent on how you acquire that asset. Typically, you buy it. Right. If you were to buy an asset and I came up to you and I said, what is your initial basis? Well, it's kind of like cost plus. And what I mean by that is all of those costs, right? If we have our little timeline here, we buy it, it gets shipped, blah, blah, blah. Up until we sort of flip the on switch, right? All of those costs, as it were, are capitalized and become part of our initial basis, right? So say that we buy a machine, it's, you know, $100. We pay $20 for shipping. We got to pay $10 to get it installed, right? Maybe, you know, there's like some major improvement. Uh, what's our basis? Well, it's more than just, you know, the $100, right? It's going to be like $120, $130 uh, on there. Hey, was there any tax, right? All of those costs up until we flip the on switch, as well as any kind of like major capitalized improvements on there to distinguish it from like routine maintenance. Um, the next way you can acquire an asset is through a gift, right? And whenever we have a gift, there's two parties, right? You have um, essentially a donor, the person making the gift, and the donee, the person receiving the gift. In this situation, we're saying we are the donee. Um, likewise, whenever we talk about a gift, what is it, right? Well, from a legal standpoint, it's a detached and disinterested transfer of property. Uh, there's no consideration with a gift, right? It's not like, uh, I'm going to give you $100, but I expect you to clean your room, right? No, that's kind of like quid pro quo, like this for that. Uh, a gift is just like, here, I'm going to give you $100. Um, you know, I don't expect anything in return. So, from our situation, right, imagine like, you know, our grandma or something gave us, you know, some type of, you know, property as a gift during her life, right? Uh, then you know, imagine I came up to you and I said, well, what is your basis in that gift that your grandma gave you? Because maybe you sold it. We know that it triggers this formula. Um, well, the general rule is going to be a carryover basis, right? Whatever basis grandma had in that gift is now your basis, right? And the reason I have here this Pokemon card is, you know, Pokemon cards, if you bought them in the 90s, like maybe grandma had a Pokemon card, they have gone up in value over time. And if we were to be more specific with the rule, right? We said generally it's going to be a carryover basis, but what do we mean by that, right? What we mean is we say, hey, if on the date of the gift, right, when grandma gave us this Pokemon card, uh, if its fair market value was greater than what she paid, right, she paid 75, now it's worth 100, it's gone up in value, then we're going to use a carryover basis. Most of the time, things go up in value over time, right? It's like houses go up. So like generally, most of the time, it's going to be appreciated property gone up, and we're going to use a carryover basis. On the flip side, right, if the property has gone down over time, right, like TY, or this is like a little beanie baby tag, you know, maybe grandma bought these beanie babies in the 90s and, you know, spent all this money and now they're not worth anything, right? They're kind of like loser property from a financial standpoint. And what we're saying here is if on the date of the gift, the fair market value, right, the beanie baby's worth 100, but, you know, grandma paid 150. Then what we do, right, to determine your basis in it, the donee basis, we have to wait until you sell that asset to determine the basis, right? In other words, it's kind of like grandma gives us the gift right here, right? You just kind of hold on and say, I don't know my basis for a disposition event until I sell it, right? And then when you sell it, right, we need to look at your sales price to determine what your basis is. And essentially, if we sell it above the donor's basis, above grandma's basis, then at, you know, namely at a gain, we're going to take uh, the donor's basis, grandma's basis. If we sell it below the fair market value, namely at a loss, 
then we're going to use the fair market value basis, the 100 bucks. If it's somewhere in between, right, the porridge is not too hot, the porridge is not too cold, then essentially we're going to use the sales price as the basis and there will be no gain or loss on there. Now, one thing to be aware of, it's like, well, if we don't know the basis until we sell it, what happens if we're using this asset in the business and we need to depreciate it, right? Well, for depreciation purposes, which is separate from, you know, the disposition event, the donee's basis, your basis is the lesser of the fair market value on the date of the gift or the donor's basis on the date of the gift. Let's look at an example here. Um, yeah, this makes more sense with numbers. All right, so a taxpayer received 100 shares of stock as a gift on 1-8. On the date of the gift, the stock was worth $15,000, right? So there's the fair market value on the date of the gift. The donor, grandma, right, her basis, right, so the donor's basis was 10 grand. So it's gone up in value, right? It's like the Pokemon card. I then come up to you and I say, okay, grandma gave you this item. It's appreciated. Can you please tell me your basis? Well, the fair market value on the date of the gift is greater than what grandma paid. Accordingly, grandma's basis becomes your basis in there. If we were to flip it, right, you know, say that the fair market value on the date of the gift was $8,000, right? It's gone down in value, right? It's like the Beanie Baby. Then what we have to do is, right, we have to wait until you sell that property to determine your basis, right? So if you sell it, for example, at 11,000, right? Then, right, we're going to use grandma's basis, right? It was above her basis. So, right, the 10 here becomes the 10 here, right? So it'll be a gain, a thousand dollar gain. If you were to sell it for $7,000, right? Below the fair market value, right? Your seven is below 8,000. Then what we do in this case, right, we're going to use the fair market value as the basis for a loss amount, right? Seven minus eight is one. If it's somewhere in between, right, the porridge is not too hot, the porridge is not too cold, then we're going to just use the sales price, the amount realized, minus the adjusted basis, and there will be no gain or loss on that. Okay. We talked about that, right? And again, this isn't something you're going to hear once and you'll magically get it. You kind of have to run the numbers, do some problems. Uh, we talked about, you know, grandma giving us a gift during her life, right? That's great. But what happens if grandma, uh-oh, you know, grandma was to pass away, right? And she gives us something in her will, right? Well, if you would give, as it were, a gift at death, then what happens is it's called an inheritance, Right? And essentially what we do here is we say, oh, okay, you know, unfortunately, grandma passed away on this date, right? The general rule is going to be, right, say grandma gave us her car, right? She passes away. The general rule, what we say here is whatever that car was worth on the date of grandma's death, right? Maybe it's worth 10 grand. That now becomes our basis in it, right? For purposes of inherited property, right? It's, um, you know, always as a general rule, the fair market value on the date of debt. In other words, you know, maybe grandma paid six grand for this car, right? Her basis, but it's gone up in value. Well, in this case, right, because it's an inheritance, it's the fair market value on the date of death. One thing to be aware of here is uh, if you inherit property, uh, it's always going to be considered long term for purposes of uh, you know capital gains, regardless of how long the decedent right the decedent is the person who died how long grandma held it on there. We do have an exception, right? Uh, you know one of the things here says you can look to right the general rule here is the fair market value at the date of death. But um, you can also pick this alternative valuation date, right? Where essentially what they do is they you know, go out six months, you know, they look at 
when the property from the estate was actually distributed, right? What was the earlier of the two, six months or that? And you would pick the fair market value on those dates, right? So maybe the property was distributed here. It was worth 11 grand. Six months later, that car was worth 12, right? Well, in this case, if you elected the alternative valuation date, what's the earlier of six months or the distribution date, right? The earlier is 11,000. Uh, that would be your basis. But this is, um, you know, by election. It's not required. In this case, you'd probably, um, you know, you might want to consider using just the general rule on there. Next one here, property converted from personal to business use, right? Maybe, uh, right, we have a laptop. Right, it's like not the greatest laptop, but it's good enough. Right, there's a little keyboard, um, and we create an Etsy business or something. Right, uh, if I came up to you and I said, you know, oh, you sold your laptop that you used in your Etsy business, that triggers the amount realized minus adjusted basis. What is your, uh, you know, basis in that property? Well, the general rule is going to be if the fair market value on the date of conversion, right? So maybe it's worth $1,000 on the date of conversion, right there, you convert it from personal to business use. Uh, if it's greater than your basis, right? So I don't know, maybe you paid $700 for this laptop uh, and now COVID hit and it's gone up in value, right? So the fair market value is the bigger of the two. In that case, right, your basis in it is going to be your basis for purposes of the business use, right? So if the fair market value on the date of conversion is greater than the basis, a thousand is greater than 700, then the basis for the taxpayer is essentially a carryover basis, right? On there, carryover basis is the general rule. Kind of like gifts, right? You can think of like gifts, general rule, carryover basis, property converted, general rule, carryover basis. We do have an exception if it's that depreciated property babies on there. So you can look at 11.2, 11.3, 11.4 with that. Okay, we said we talked about initial tax basis. We said you back out you know, any cost recovery, generally depreciation, right? That's the big one here, depreciation. Uh, and that's going to get you your adjusted basis for tax purposes. It's kind of like financial accounting, right? If you remember on the books, it's like, you know, costs minus accumulated depreciation gets you net book value, your carrying value. For tax, it's kind of like initial basis minus any depreciation gets you your adjusted basis, right? Uh, one of the things to be aware of is that depreciation for tax purposes is generally more favorable, higher than book, right? You like you 179 immediately expense this entire thing. That's going to give you, you know, a lot more depreciation after year one versus like on your books and records, you're doing this thing like straight line, like hundred bucks a year or something. So we said, right, the disposition event, it triggers the amount realized by adjusted basis, right, gives you your gain or loss, your realized gain or loss. But then we um, you know, have to distinguish that from what you recognize or you actually put on the tax return, right? So maybe you calculated a $100 gain. The general rule is you're going to put $100 on your tax return that you report or you recognize, right? That's the general rule. Your realized gain of $100 is going to be your recognized gain that you book and you put on the tax return. There are exceptions, right? Sometimes we can kick the can, right? That $100, we may say later, right? It's like my little nephew and I'm like, hey, do you want to like, you know, work on your flashcards later, right? He, that's just a nice way of saying no. Um, or alternatively, right? We can permanently exclude it forever, right? Like in the Sandlot, if you've ever seen that movie. Uh, on there. So that's what this slide is showing here, right? General rule, that gain that we realize that we calculate in that uh, formula is going to be what we recognize. There are, however, exceptions where we can permanently exclude the amount. 
Or alternatively, we can kick the can and say, you know, yes, we have calculated a $100 gain that we realized, but only 70 of it, um, you know, of the 100 that we realized, 30 we're going to recognize now, and 70 we're going to recognize later, right? We're going to kick the can until a later point in time. We will look at in the next lecture, you know, these scenarios where that comes into play. All right, so we're talking about a disposition event, amount realized minus adjusted basis. Typically, right, we're going to be looking at business property, so maybe a Schedule C taxpayer or like a partnership, an S Corp. Uh, when we talk about property, right, in this event, we know that there's generally three types of assets, right, like capital assets, which are non business assets. Typically, we think these are just like, you know, things an individual owns. Typically, you think stock. We have ordinary assets, which are the current assets of the business. Typically, you would think like inventory, right? So here, I'm going to put typically think stock. Here, typically, you think inventory. And then we have 1231 assets, right, which are non current assets of a business. And when we say 1231, right, first off, that's like an IRS code section, but that really means 1245 property, right? You know, basically, you know, machinery, equipment, uh, you know, personal property used in the business, intangibles, as well as 1250 property when we're talking about real property on there. Okay, so right when we talk about capital assets, generally we mean things not used in a business like stock, right? Um, but it's more than that, right? When we were, if we were to talk about it, it's something held for investment, a stock or bond, for the production of income, or right for personal use, right? A car, a house, a personal item. One thing here is you always have to look um, to the usage to determine whether something is a capital asset. It's not the asset in and of itself, right? So for example, raw land, right? Well, if I came up to you and I said, what is raw land? How would you put it in one of those three buckets? Well, you would say it depends, right? It depends on how the taxpayer uses it, right? If somebody were just like buying a plot of land on campus thinking that like, you know, it was going to go up in value because the campus is expanding, then it's kind of like an investment, like a stock or something, and it would be considered a capital asset. If somebody was like a full-time real estate professional, right, and their everyday job was to buy and sell plots of land, well, then it would basically be like their inventory um, on there. Or alternatively, right, like say we have a business, we buy the building, there comes with some land next to it, right, where it's just like, you know, raw land, you know, in our business, uh, then it would be like a 1231 asset. So you have to look at the usage on there. Now, a few things with this, right, if we were to talk about capital assets, uh, we said long-term capital gains, and there's a netting process, the, you know, the other chapter on it, uh, they get that preferential rate, the 0, 15, or 20%. Those people are paying 15% unless you're making over like 500,000 a year. And we said when you run that netting process, if you're overall, you net all your gains with your losses. If you're at an overall loss, then you can offset up to $3,000 of ordinary income on there. So all else being equal, right, if I came up to you and I said, would you rather have wage income or, you know, cap gains, you'd probably say cap gains because of that preferential rate and the ability to offset ordinary income. A little bit different when we're talking about C corporations, right? So these were like individuals, generally they're going to prefer, you know, uh, capital gain income. Corporate taxpayers on the 1120, right, there is no preferential rate. They pay 21% on everything right? They don't, there's no zero, 15 or 20. It's like 21% on everything. Uh, likewise, do be aware that capital losses for a corporation can only offset capital gains, right? In other words, like 
you know, say I was a corporation, I owned Apple stock, I sold it at a $200 loss. I cannot use that $200 capital loss to offset the ordinary business income of the corporation, like from us, like selling our goods and services. The best we get with that um, is uh, being able to offset other capital gains. So yes, maybe I offset or maybe I lost on the Apple stock, but maybe I also sold Amazon stock at a gain of $1,000 then and only then can I use the Apple loss to offset the Amazon gain? Uh, one of the things here, if they run the numbers, right, uh, overall, right, if they're at a net capital loss, what happens here, right? Oh, well, we have that $1,000 Apple or we have that like $200 Apple loss we can't use, right? Uh, what happens? Well, you go back to last year's. Do I have any capital gains uh, income there? If no, go back another year. If no, go back another year. Then go forward, any there, two, three, four, five. So it's kind of like you go back three. Was there any capital gain income I can use this loss to offset? And then if not, forward five, you carry that loss forward on there. Ordinary assets, right? These are typically uh, those used in a trade or business, right? You're normally talking about inventory here, right? If you sell them at a gain, right? You're going to pay you know, ordinary tax rates on that. If you sell them at a loss, right? They can offset ordinary income. So that's like a good thing. They offset ordinary income, but it's kind of a bad thing because there is no preferential rate on them, right? Uh, with it. Then when we talk about 1231 assets, right? We said that it's 1245, right? Kind of personal property and tangibles, 1250 real estate. And then they have something called like true 1231, which is land, right? Uh, in there. Generally, we're talking about non-current assets in a business, right? Non-current because we've held it for more than one year, right? And in this situation, Right. One of the things we have to be aware of, right, we'll talk about it, you know, in this like next slide is something called depreciation recapture. Right. Whenever you have 1231 assets, depreciation recaptures in play. And what I mean by that is uh, 1231 is kind of the best of both worlds. Right. You were to sell, you know, this machine or something on there. If you sell it at a gain right, you're going to get the preferential rate, right? It's kind of like the smiley on there. If you sell it at a loss, right, you can offset ordinary income, right? So it's like, you know, other smiley there compared to the other two types of assets where there was only like one smiley, right? Like here, you only get one smiley. Um, capital gains tends to only be one smiley. On there, I guess you can use like up to 3,000 on the loss. But uh, with this, right, one of the things we got to be aware of conceptually with depreciation recapture is uh, whenever you were to buy, right, so say you bought this machine, right, uh, what happens is, right, as you own it, you depreciate it, you depreciate it, you depreciate it, you depreciate it. Then at a certain point in time, you go to sell it, right? You sell the asset. And what happens here is, right, we know when you sell it, you get the smiley, right? Um, and we know if you sell it at a loss, you also get the smiley. On top of that, right, when you were depreciating it, right, every time you depreciate, that's an expense, right? The bigger an expense, the less income, right? So essentially what's happening here is every time you take the depreciation expense, you're effectively saving uh, and offsetting ordinary income up to potentially 37% on a taxpayer's return. So it's almost like a triple smiley here, right? So here is what happens with depreciation or capture. You're depreciating it, depreciating it, depreciating it, Taking the smiley, taking the smiley, taking the smiley, offsetting up to 
you go to sell it, right? You sell it at a gain, right? And you pay that preferential tax rate on it, the 0, 15 or 20%. IRS comes in and says, no, right? We're going to come back in this depreciation, right? We're going to try to undo this smiley, right? We're going to try to make it more just like a neutral face. And essentially what we do is, right, we are going to look at the gain or loss from the sale, the amount realized, minus the adjusted basis, right, gives you, you know, the realized gain or loss, right? Assuming it was a gain, right, like a $100 gain, what we're going to look at and say is, hey, of that gain, right, maybe you took $20 of depreciation, right, 20 of that gain, we're going to tax at ordinary income. In the leftover, right, we're going to give you the preferential rate on there. Different scenarios, different setups we'll talk about in the next lecture. But how we sort of undo this guy right here, right, or at least make it a little bit more neutral so as not to you know, give you like everything under the sun, is whenever you go to sell it, we're going to reclassify some of the gain on there to, you know, as it were, undo this depreciation. That's called depreciation recapture. We will look at in the next lecture uh, how this specifically manifests for different scenarios.